most people are, you know, kind of uh, wryly amusing, and if they're willing to kind of be vulnerable enough to show their humour, um, which is part of being vulnerable enough to be to show their authenticity, then um, then they can be funny. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, politics, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business and your life. Humorology puts the fun in business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast has built a career on being a compassionate, creative and comedic conservative. As a powerful political point man for Prime Minister John Major and party leader William Hague, he progressed his party using his penchant for punchlines. In 2013, he was made a member of the House of Lords, where he sits as a Conservative. He has served as the former executive editor of The Times and still writes quick-witted, award-winning commentary columns on everything from politics to football. As a prolific journalist, he has been named Political Commentator of the Year on four separate occasions. More recently, he has served as a political pundit and prominent presenter with a reputation as the Lord of Leaving Audiences Learning and Laughing. Danny Finkelstein, welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Paul, thank you so much for that introduction. I, I, I sound absolutely brilliant. I can't wait to hear myself. <laughs> well, you are absolutely brilliant, Danny, and uh, I, I can't wait to get on with hearing more about what you've got to tell us, because you've had such an extraordinary life. Um, I know you're passionate about trying to help people change their minds and be more flexible and, and if you like, see other people's positions. Um, I heard you once say that you've uh, got to make the psychological cost to people of changing their position easier to pay. Does humour help loosen people's entrenched positions? Yes, it does, because they, uh, you know, because liking is actually a large part of agreeing with people, uh, as is a feeling of of sort of uh, being having something in common with other people but actually I, I to be quite honest I don't really think that is the reason why I use you humor you you make it sound a very conscious process I, I think it's just sort of genetic a little bit um my mother uh, in particular was always responding to uh to to everything with a joke and I guess I just inherited that from her well it's very interesting because when I was doing research ab uh, about you, um, your your mother and your father were refugees and and had very very difficult lives. I think your mother was in Belson, your father was an exile in Siberia. Did they talk about how they coped with those situations? Was humour part of that coping strategy? It really was. Um, I, I do remember going down to uh, once uh, Ronald Reagan went to uh, to Bitburg, which was a cemetery in Germany as part of a state visit. And it was discovered there were some SS officers buried there uh, and it became a massive political problem for Reagan in the States. And so he decided he was also going to go and visit Belson. And I remember... Um, hearing this on the radio and I went down the stairs to my mum she was she had her back to me she was washing up and I said oh mum I've just heard on the radio Ronald Reagan's going to go to Belson and without turning around she said so what I've been and that was very <laughs> typical of her um she had a sort of uh, her favorite joke was uh, apart from that Mrs Lincoln how did you enjoy the theatre um <laughs> because she believed that a sense of proportion was um was very important and my father yeah my father too um and I, I just it was I'm just researching a book on their lives. And I remembered when I was a child that um, my father explained about the journey they took to be reunited with his father. He'd been in the Gulag, he joined the Polish Free Army. It's a very perilous journey that linked those people up, but they had a soldier with them who bribed their way onto the train. And I remember as a kid, he told me that it was a perfume that called the Breath of Stalin that they used. And I 
actually took him seriously. I thought that that was a true, that was true. Um, and it was only when I was, as a, I even may have told this story as an adult, I think, um, to, to great laughs at a big at a big reception once. And it was only when I was researching it that I thought it was obviously vodka, right? Uh, and um, he was just joking. So yes, they did deal with their experiences um, with humour to some extent, yeah. Well, it's interesting because my father was a Hungarian refugee and uh, at 17 years old, he was in the Second World War. Um, uh, originally, uh, you know your history, but in '44, the Hungarians changed and supported Hitler and all the Hungarians hated Hitler. So they threw down their weapons and joined the Allies. And so, you know, and my father has been in, uh, you know, refugee camps, concentration camps, and in '56, you know, had to up sticks and leave. Um, and he was always of that same mind that humour was all they couldn't take away from you because they took everything else. And so it became a valuable commodity. Do you think you talked about it being genetic? Do you, do you think that, that everybody who has people who understand the value of it uses it in their lives? When, when you talked about the role that political jokes has played in my life, and it's a slight embarrassment to me because, you know, you like to um, to be thought of as very sage individual when you're called up by, uh, you know, the Chancellor of the Exchequer or the Prime Minister's office, uh, and um, they want to know whether you've got a joke. It's slightly deflating. <laughs> <laughs> But 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 seriously, um, I, I do. I, I so I I think it's something that you kind of either that is just a way of thinking or it isn't. Uh, but I do think it's a sort of quite humanising way. If you, particularly if you accept that you yourself are a bit ridiculous, um, that it does prevent you, I think, from the worst. Um, Monstros monstrosities of ego if you if you uh, kind of understand the human condition as being kind of intrinsically funny so was the young danny naturally funny i mean was he mischievous was it what was he like what no whether it, i don't know whether i'm funny now and and certainly no actually that's a very interesting thing i don't think so so i think that um the confidence to be humorous uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's very person dependent, right? You 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 have to have a degree of confidence to be funny in front of somebody, uh, and um, I you know when you don't have that, when someone makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable, you might not so easily make a joke because it could go wrong. Um, and uh, I'm definitely my funniest when the person doesn't do that. You know, it doesn't put does put you at your ease and you feel you can make a joke either at other people's expense or even at theirs. And um, you have to have, yeah, you have to have confidence that they can take that and not all people can take that equally. Uh, uh, but as I've grown older, of course you've grown in confidence. And so you're able to be, well, you know, I say funny, I, I don't I hesitate to ascribe that to myself, but you are able to attempt at humor uh, with, um, with other people. Well, it's interesting you talk about that. That's this symbiotic process of humour and, you know, uh, and feeling comfortable. But first of all, you have to be the person who, uh, I don't know, offers the, the, the humour olive leaf or something, don't you, in order to start that process. Do you do that, any of that consciously or is everything now just unconscious competence? No, it's it's un, it's pretty much unconscious, just the way that I am, and I know that I'm sitting in a meeting or a leader conferences at the times. I mean, I can never resist making some stupid joke about whatever we're talking about. Sometimes not 100% appropriate, and I'm absolutely certain. You know how people get cancelled um, for some terrible thing that they do or say. And in my case, it will certainly not be um, some sort of crass opinion of mine. It'll be a stu it'll be a joke, definitely. Um, although I'm, I don't tend to, I don't tend to like um, either crude humour or you know it's very unlikely to be a um, a joke which has like a racial overtone that would never happen, sexist joke or a homophobic joke, and I never that wouldn't be the case. It'll just be some sort of stupidly inappropriate thing that I say. Well, yeah, but but isn't humour all about finding the, the pushing things to the limit a little, yeah, a little bit, bit anyway? Yeah, you you do have to to have 
you do yes it is yeah you have to have a sort of a uh, little bit of uh, an idea for where the edge is definitely and I, I just always remember my when it was very typical of mine I said her great sense of humor was her sense of humor was you know apart from that Mrs Lincoln had you enjoy the theater but she also had this kind of idea of that that joke I said to you about Belson that was typical and uh when my father died, my mother was my mother and my father had a great relationship, and my mother was devastated when my father died. But I do remember going; I'd been to see Chelsea versus Norwich, and um, my father died while I was there. Uh, he had been very, very ill. It wasn't that surprising that he died. I came. My mother was at the hospice with my father's body in the room. <laughs> I went in, um, and uh, you know, she said one or two words about dad dying, and then she said, "What was the score?" Right. And the and the and the timing of it and just the situation of her mind at that moment was just um exquisite. It was like just about all right. And also she was the biggest, you know, she was the great mourner of my father's demise. So it was all it was all right. And it's very that was very typical of her. So she just filled felt the uh how far you could go with something at that moment. She knew it intuitively. It's a dangerous world to do that. Uh, my father died uh, six years ago while I was um, doing a conference in uh, the South of France. And uh, it was a horrible shock. It was a, a, a heart attack. And I was in a little bit of shock. And I went out uh, the next evening um, just to eat because I was waiting to see how I was going to get back and uh, do that. And a friend of mine did one of the most extraordinary jokes I've ever had. Uh, a woman at the table very sympathetically said, where were you when it happened? And I said, actually, I found out that I was actually speaking on stage when he died. And my friend without missing a beat said, that makes two of you. It's <laughs> a brilliant joke. It is a brilliant joke, but the, the danger in that was I could have done that. I definitely could have done that. And that's all about your friend probably knew you quite well. He knew that Very you, well. yeah, he knew that you would think that was funny. Uh, judged his moment, right? If you did get that wrong, that's a disaster, that joke, but it's not a disaster. It's a brilliant, memorable joke. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm very jealous of that. I'd love to have made that joke. <laughs> well, well it, it was perfect actually and and guess what you, I remember it like it was yesterday and it was strangely when you have a good relationship and when you get it it's strangely appropriate to do something to break of course. that state of course it is, yeah. you you were talking about um uh, politicians and humor and you've been around so many politicians and humour. I know that you've been a member of the Labour Party, you've been in the SDP for <laughs> like nine years, and Conservatives, you know where the gag, uh, the joke's going, but who, is there a party that is naturally funnier? Uh, no. no. Oh, come I mean, on. First of all, no, because first of all, to be, although you said I was in the Labour Party, it was like I was 16 years old, and it was sort of short period before I joined the SDP, so I couldn't okay. really claim, I couldn't really claim a great familiarity with it. No, I don't think so. I think humour... I mean, look, there are some politicians who are naturally brilliant at telling a joke, using humour. They use humour in meetings and, uh, you know, and when you're with them, it's funny. And there are some people that kind of aren't. Uh, and um, uh, I don't think that's a, a party political thing. And I've never got this thing, you know, um, one of the things that used to uh, drive me crazy at university was... Tories you say, you know, the problem with lab, the left people on the left is they don't have a sense of humour. And that is obviously utterly ridiculous, right? What it meant was that they weren't willing to put up with crass comments that were sexist or racist. It wasn't like to have a sense of humour. So I, I don't, I never agree with that. No. Well, but do you think now in, in the current state of politics, charisma and humour, if we put them together, are essential to, to win, as it were? Yeah, I, do, I think that's always been the case to whichever audience you can you can appeal to. So, um, you know, in the in until the modern broadcast era, it was who could be charismatic in the House of Commons, um, and um, probably before that, it was who could be charismatic to the king. 
Um, and um, now it's who can be charismatic to a wider audience, maybe use social media in a, in a creative way. So the medium always changes. Um, and humour's always had its um, always had its place, although obviously it does change. You know what what you can read, sort of old copies of Punch, and they're not funny at all. And I do rem I remember that uh, you know uh, the Private Eye always used to have this joke where they said they people you would send if you sent them a, one of those signs of the times, and um, they they sent back to a friend of mine. Uh, they sent. Uh, Dear Mr. X, I won't name it. Dear Mr. X, uh, thank you very much for sending us your sign of the times. As you will probably have appreciated by now, this isn't this wasn't remotely funny. May I suggest that you send it to Punch? Which is <laughs> <laughs> Joke. Uh, but actually, when you read Punch, some of that humour actually is in fact very funny. But not if you read a hundred and you know hundred years old. Some of the jokes are just completely bewildering. How on earth anybody could have found them funny? They're so leaden. Well, you, you say uh, we were interviewing um, the, your old colleague, William Haig, right. and, uh, uh, and William uh, was saying that actually Margaret Thatcher wasn't funny. And, uh, you know, it was quite hard to give her a gag uh, for her to understand even. The, Did he tell the, you about the, the Monty Python thing? Yes. Yeah. So that's and that is absolutely true. Right. Uh, John Whittingdale. Um, John Whittingdale used to. Uh, you, you, you know, told that story about her and he was like devoted to her. Yeah, so I understand. She really didn't get it. So it said about Theresa May that she wasn't funny. And I, and actually Theresa um, wasn't great at telling a joke. She could, she once or twice did some really brilliant things when she uh, thanked Jeremy Corbyn for mansplaining her. She delivered that brilliantly. But what she could do was get a joke. If you made a joke to Theresa, she would laugh, right? She wasn't humorless uh, at all, even though she wasn't brilliant at telling jokes. So some people can get them, but they can't tell them. Well, that's very interesting because all as part of the Humorology project, I always say it's actually being part of the process. And I think being a good audience is as important as being able to tell a joke. So being an easy laugher and being warm and receptive to it. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, is is also enticing and and you know makes you part of the team we have friends you know who aren't all great gag tellers but will laugh easily and are very welcome because you know all of us who tell gags need an audience don't we <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah it's certainly true that's certainly true <laughs> tell me a true funny story about something that's happened to you Dan. Well do you know, that is the worst question that anybody can ask. Do, do you not find this? When you're asked, when you're asked to give a to give a leaving speech for somebody, and I used to, there was one point in my life when I was director of the Conservative Research Department after the 2001 general election, after the 1997 general election, and uh, it was the worst Conservative results since 1832. And as you can imagine, I had to do quite a lot of leaving speeches. Some people who were leaving on purpose and some people who, um, who as, it, so, as it were, we left um and um the, i and you always have to think of something funny to say about this person right and what were you gonna even the person who had who had um who had applied for a job as uh, uh as a researcher for the labor party giving me and Gillian shepherd the conservative education secretary as references you know what were you supposed to say at his leaving day so i i always thought about it for say something the funniest thing that ever happened to you and and the worst thing is it, funny thing is one thing right but when someone says that's the funniest thing that ever happened to you and then you tell this story you think that that is the funniest thing that's ever happened to you you're 58 <laughs> Um, but um, at the beginning of speeches, I often um, thank the audience for inviting me. And I note the fact that I've got a sort of um, uh, reasonable size audience and it's quite convenient to get there. And I tell them, this is true, that I went once to give a speech in Norwich. And from where I live, it takes something in the region of five hours to get to Norwich University. You have to get to the train station, wait for the train. It takes several hours to get there. And I was giving a speech, right? So uh, I thought, okay, I'll go a voluntary speech in tiles, not being paid or anything. Go all the, get all the way there, uh, five hours. Open the door, and there are literally two people, and one of them is the person that had invited me, right? Um, uh, and 
the, the other person's attitude, what do I do? So I better, I thought I better give them a talk, right? I sort of sit down and I do a kind of slightly embarrassed version of what I was supposed to say anyway. And, um, and I, at the end of it, I said, would you like to join? This is what I was there for. Would you like to join the Young Social Democrats? And he said, well, I would, but it would interfere with the terms of my parole. <laughs> That genuinely happened. Then I had to stack all the chairs and go home again. Five hours. Oh, oh my God. Well, that's wonderful. Is everyone potentially funny? Or, I mean, is it just a no? I can see you already going, no, no. Oh, I, so it, so I'll tell you how I found that out, right? When you when you work for politicians, um, you know, I mean, as, a, as not work for them, but, you know, kind of work with them and help them with jokes and stuff like that, um, you... Uh, sometimes they can absolutely uh, brilliantly tell a joke and sometimes um, they really, really can't tell a joke. And um, I, I, and if you don't realise that, you can have a disaster. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm not going to name the people because it's not fair to them. And I'm always trying to, you know, I've tried to, to respect their, their kind of confidences, but I've worked for one or two politicians where the jokes come out as a horrendous insult to the person they were engaged with engaged with in the commons was one once or twice was john prescott and and i and i you know just watch between your fingers and actually one of the worst things that uh, happened to me um uh, during the time of writing was when i was working for the conservative party and one of the important things is people have to be willing to laugh with you and at that point they were laughing at the conservative party not with it this was before the 97 general election uh, they were either laughing at the conservative party or they were furious with it but what they weren't doing was laughing with it uh, and uh, we wrote a satire of the labor manifesto it was a very of it, it was a lay, satire of labor's kind of policy document it was a very ill conceived idea and i think now I'm more politically sophisticated years later, I'd realised that that wouldn't work. But at the time, I thought it was amusing. But instead of just issuing it and letting people read it and think, actually, this is quite a good satire um, of their proposals, um, Brian Bawinney, uh, the chairman of the Conservative Party, found it so funny, he decided that he and Michael Heseltine were going to read it out, which involved Michael reading the straight bits and Brian reading the funny bits. Right. Well, Brian, God bless him, he's just recently died and I loved him a lot, actually. Uh, but um, he was not the greatest verbal wit, let's put it that way. And I sat at the back of the room and at the end of this conference, Michael White said, um, Chairman, I'm wondering, do you think this is the worst press conference ever given by a political party? And I could just, I, it was... I wish the ground could have swallowed me up. They were all my lines. Nobody had laughed at all, obviously. And then I thought I'm going to get a story in tomorrow's paper, Britain's unfunniest man with a big yeah. picture. That was so, yeah, the answer to your question, that was a long way of saying absolutely no way is it the case that everybody is equally amusing. So, so then why are people so delusional? Because I, I've never read anybody uh, or or seen anybody or heard anybody say, I don't have a sense of humour. You know, you, on on their dating profiles, everybody says good sense of humour. You know, what is it? Is it a bad delusion? sense of humour. a bad sense of humour on your dating profile. Eh? Um, well, um, first of all, everybody... People find different things funny, but we're all delusional in different ways. The cognitive biases we live with are, are, um, are huge, right? And I know that myself. I, I was doing a piece um, last week, which was all about how people's political motivations are, um, are fundamentally about self-interest and economic. We just haven't, often can't work it out for ourselves. And while I was kind of thinking about it, I thought to myself, you know what, my politics, I'm, I'm a... Um, I'm a social liberal and a relative economic liberal. Um, and I thought, you know, as a, as a basically as a Jew living in Pirna with a master's degree, working in a top rate tax paying job, I'm actually a cliche, right? And a lot of the time you don't, but you don't realise that about yourself. You think all of your political views are nothing to do with your demographic uh, qualities. So you, we're all fool ourselves a lot of the time. You'd never be able to live if you didn't. Uh, so I can't blame people for thinking they're funny and not being. 
so yeah, that cognitive bias you think is what drives everybody because we have to be delusional otherwise we'll be suicidal yeah. by the way the other thing uh, occurs which is some people well so you know i said to you the most embarrassing thing is thinking that you're um funny and uh, not uh, that the, uh, the most embarrassing thing is being asked to think of a funny story so sometimes i'm a Peer. this is probably one of those occasions people tune in in the expectation of humor that is not then uh, an expectation that is realized let's put it that way uh, and um i do the news quiz occasionally and uh when i do that um i always think oh my god i'm supposed to be funny on this and um the worst thing at the end you usually i'm quite fortunate that you get some people who who say that was funny some people and that i'm not sure whether this is an insult or um or not, um, it, when they say it was unexpectedly funny. Um, uh, but then there's always those people who say, um, I didn't expect him to be funny, and he wasn't. And those those are the ones that you think, yeah, I knew it all along. <laughs> you know, you kind of know. So uh, we all, as, if you didn't engage in a degree of, um, of self-delusion, you'd never live, would you? Well, you'd never do anything either, would you, really? You'd never come no. out of your comfort zone. And everything. It's, it's interesting. We had um, uh, Rick Wilson from the Lincoln Project um, in America on the programme, and he was saying... And I think this is good advice for anybody who has to go uh, and talk on something thing is when uh, he went to do Bill Maher's show, they, the producer came up to him and said, you didn't write any jokes, did you? And he went, of course not. I'm not a comedian. He goes, great, because some people come on here and think they have to write a joke. Really, the whole point of it is that you actually just relax and be yourself and if you're going to be funny, it will come out. And and I think that's the hardest thing is you can't, you know, you know, when you have to, when people write a joke in a speech and you've done thousands of them and you, you, you go, you deliver the comedy line and then it dies on its ass. Mm. And then you have to say, but seriously, you know. Well, that's completely correct. And sometimes you, uh, sometimes you tell a, you write a comedy line and it works brilliantly and sometimes the same principle will produce a joke and it won't work at all. It's context dependent a lot yeah. of the time. And so, I mean, really for our listeners, it's about listening to the audience and being in the moment, isn't it? I mean, because um, the news well, quiz... I've written, a lot of jokes hard... that, yeah, I've written a lot of jokes that are delivered by other people and then you've got to... To do that, you've got to kind of think about the context they're in and the audience they've got. Uh, one of the things that were conf party conference jokes are particularly perilous. There are a number of reasons for this. First of all, um, the the audience is very hard to judge. You can't judge whether it's going to be full or empty. A half em an, an empty audience won't laugh at the joke at all. That a full audience will will very much laugh at. Secondly, if you've got an empty audience. But a group full of journalists who are listening to the minister make a speech, um, they'll they're bound to find it particularly unfunny, right? Because they partly is because um, the jokes is kind of often partisan and at the expense of another political party, and quite rightly, while a, that that's funny to a conservative audience, he's not funny to anybody else. <laughs> and so you can. It can be a total disaster, and sometimes it's better not to not to try to make them. I think, but it's hard in advance to work out that that's, you know, that that's the case. Well, have you had the situation? Because uh, doing what I do as a psychologist, I get brought in to help with people's speeches. But you know, as you're more on the writing side. I'm more on the performance side, and you know, the the psychological side of getting them ready. And uh, have you had the situation where you've had to talk people out of doing a joke because you know it's going, they can't deliver it? Um, I have, yeah, I can't, I have, yeah, I have a few times. I've said, don't, don't, if you have to reach for that joke, just don't use it. And, and actually, that was particularly the case with Theresa May, who could, she didn't have to be talked into it, you know, talked out of it. She wasn't kind of gagging to tell, but it was sometimes she'd say, look, use this if it comes, if 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 the ball comes very close to you, you can hit it, but don't reach for this. Because in Prime Minister's questions, you, you, 
you can do a funny joke which only really works if the other person's doing something saying something or behaving in a certain way then you can engage with it and if and if it doesn't come close to you you can't and you mustn't because then the joke really creaks then and you've got to be very very careful yeah, I, I, I agree. We had Alistair Campbell on the show and he was saying uh, that, uh, and you were probably partly responsible for this, the, the, the one thing that really scared them was William Hague at Prime Minister's Questions because they could he could destroy them with humour and they had to get a I, whole... St- I tell you what, I'm de- I was deeply involved in that. Quite a lot of those gags were... I mean, they were team things, myself, George Osborne and William Hague, but they were things that I was involved in producing and um and i remember that in the sunday times one time one week um a comedian i won't name who that is because it's not fair but a, com- a, a completely external comedian was um credited with all of my jokes it was like a long list of them that were clearly been funny enough to make the newspaper but they they were credited it was the only time because you do them so that William Hague will be credited with them. You don't want to be credited with them yourself. That's not that's not the point. And in any case, they were a collegiate effort. They never want just one person. And they wouldn't work, as I discovered sometimes with other people, wouldn't have worked without William. Um, so it was incredibly annoying to discover other people to be other people uh, being credited with, uh, with, with writing them. You don't... Uh, you, so you become a bit proprietorial about them, but, uh, but they I, depend I, a little... They, they depend um, a lot on the context. William was um, was brilliant at the jokes. Uh, he knew the timing of them. He knew the tone. Um, he 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 never he had the confidence not to use them. One of his rules were, um, you know, we only use them if they're absolutely certainly dead, definitely funny, right? And we wouldn't use one that wasn't maybe only 75% likely to get a laugh, to be 100% funny. And one of the ways that we used to judge that is, do people laugh when you tell it to them, right? So, and this is my test normally, right? The joke is not, um, did you think that was funny, theoretically, right? Um, it's, does, when I tell you that story, do you, do you laugh? And I we had a joke once where we had a sort of place line in the speech, which was, um, don't book it, Robin Cook it. We knew that it was not funny, right, theoretically, and you didn't laugh, right, correctly. Um, but some, somehow, in the context of that moment when he'd been going around the world annoying people, every time we said that line to people, they, they fell about laughing. No one could tell you what it meant. Um, and um, if I told you that it was supposed to be funny, they wouldn't think it was funny. But when he used it in the speech, it brought the house down, right? Well, and um, And... That's the only test, but you can sometimes do a joke that's theoretically funny, but there's no point for somebody sitting there and going, you know what, that was actually very witty. That works in writing, but it doesn't work when you're delivering it out loud. Well, well that's the thing, and it, it, that's where the instinct for comedy comes in. Uh, we were talking to Joe Brand, who I've known for many years because we used to work at the comedy store together, and we were talking about the fact that actually when you do a heckle put-down, it actually doesn't have to be the funniest thing ever. It just has to be timed right. And that's what that sounds like, don't just book it, Robin Cook it, is just, it has a rhythm, and if you deliver it in the right moment, people will react. Um, Absolutely, absolutely. So that's, again, the the tip for humour in that is being able to be in the moment and listen yeah. And also, if you're preparing a joke, test it. And the only test that matters is when you read it out to somebody, did they af- actually laugh? Not whether they looked at it, smiled and then said, yeah, that's funny. Use it. And don't, Or they laughed and said, no, that's not funny. Don't use it. If they laugh, they laugh. And in the yeah. moment when you're telling the speech, when you're telling the joke in the speech, all that matters is does the audience laugh, right? Well, uh, because uh, humour is a, a, this strange thing whereby it's an involuntary action, Correct. isn't it? Correct. And and so the, you know that's why uh, comedians are more valued than anyone else is because they they make you do an involuntary action, and which it, it just changes your state. So it's good. What would the world be like without humour? Oh, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I do. I, I do think it. some of humour is not taking yourself or all the situations um, 
too seriously. And I think that therefore the world would be, the world would take itself and all the situations that were involved in it more seriously than they deserve. It would be, it would be too, um, it would be a sort of form of arrogance in some ways um, that, that felt that we were, uh, that everything that we were engaged in was of such importance that we couldn't undermine it in any way by laughing at it. Um, so I think humour has an important role in, certainly for me anyway, in establishing that we're all a bit ridiculous and so are all the situations that we're in. Um, and um, also that we only live for a short period and we may as well enjoy it while we're here. And I think if we didn't have humour, we'd forget all those things and that we'd lose a lot. So you have a very self-deprecating uh, way of of in of <laughs> be, well no I mean that you in have a, to there's in quite a, a lot to deprecate yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> no but I mean what that in the, supposed, in the... what are you supposed to do if you're sort of fat Jew living in pinner you are laughing <laughs> no but it, I think that that's because I I know that having talked to a lot of people in politics and in broadcasting that you are pretty much universally liked so uh, and I think that's because you don't take yourself too seriously and what we're trying to do for our listeners is give them tools that they can actually take away and, and go and and do you think that that ability to self-deprecate to not take yourself too serious is actually a valuable tool in business? I do think being well actually going one step back I do think being liked is an underrated thing. I mean, it's kind of you to say that I'm liked, and that's it's very gratifying to hear that. I, I'm, if you say it, I'm not going to tell you, call you a liar, but I didn't, I wouldn't necessarily claim that for myself. But I'm, I'm really happy about that. But the, the, um, because I, I think it's a very, very important thing, right? I think that um, it's important as part of persuasion. I think it's important intrinsically because it suggests that you bear yourself with a in a kind of appropriate way and realise you're not the only person around and try and fit in with other people in some ways. It can be a weakness because sometimes in politics you have to be tough and make tough decisions and choices. And if I, sometimes I see people doing acts of leadership and I wonder whether I'd have that sort of courage, which does sometimes lead you to not be liked. Um, but um, I think you can always do do even quite hard things in likable and dislikable words. So I tell you an example of that is is Rishi Sunak actually, who was a very likable person. I think it's part of his political strength and his strength as a leader. Um, so I think that um, yes, it's important to be liked, and humour definitely falls from that. It's hard to um, find somebody funny that you find intrinsically completely unsympathetic you don't you know even the comedians who kind of play off let's take larry david for example who yeah. plays off this kind of misanthropy you sort of there's an you've got to kind of like him enough to find the things that he finds absurd and kicks against funny and you've got to empathise with him to that degree. So I, I think it's underneath it is empathy and being liked is an incredibly important part of business. It mustn't detract you from making tough choices and tough decisions. And you can't, you can't expect that everybody will agree with you. And, you know, in politics, I've obviously made choices. And as a result of it, I'm aware people, you know, dislike those choices very passionately and find them incomprehensible sometimes. Uh, and you have to still have the courage of your convictions. But I think you can do those in likeable or dislikable ways. No, I, I, I completely agree. I think if you start from a point where you have rapport with people, if you ha have something that you have to deliver that is upsetting, um, it, it starts from that point whereby you're a decent bloke and you're only doing, you know, this because you believe in it rather than um, you're a disagreeable bloke and I always knew you were going to do something awful, you, you bastard, you know. Well, I just remember, um, I mean, a moment at a Conservative Party conference where uh, John Redwood was making a speech and he has many admirable intellectual qualities, but he's not going to be a comedian as his second career and he um he gave a, a speech about the arts 
and one of it was um, uh, step forward Ian McCartney and walk tall among the men. Now, Ian McCartney was a Labour, the Labour Party chairman, and I think the spokesman the, on the other side from John Redwood on arts or sports or something, and um, he, he was very short, right, uh, Ian McCartney, uh, and I... Can rec- there was a very very empty hall like I was one and I can just remember one person moving a chair you know uncomfortably and somebody else coughed and there was dead silence but John Ra- waited for the laugh to come right and this was a number of things that all come together one empty hall no one was ever going to joke on it secondly not intrinsically very funny thirdly no one knew who Ian McCartney was right in that audience right and I just had to explain to you kind of ruins the joke so therefore no one knew that he was short and finally if you were there and you did know that he was short and you knew who Ian McCartney was, um, it was just horrible. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Right. So you, 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 you kind of combined all of the things that you try and avoid uh, in a, in a, in a, in a joke. I just remember it as being quite an uncomfortable moment, but in its own grisly way, actually pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, if you if you write just nothing, I just remember David Hunt, who was I really really like and admire a lot, um, and uh, is a sort of humane guy and and very intelligent guy. Um, but he told this joke and it involved um, a Labour not having any principles, and he brought out a bag, a plastic bag from the shop principles, and he opened. He said, "I Labour haven't got any principles," and he got this shopping bag out, looked in it and threw it over his shoulder, said it's empty, and threw it over his shoulder, right? And for me, because it was so bad, it was absolutely hilarious. Nothing was funnier than that. So nothing is funnier than a than a joke that flops absolutely terribly at a political conference, um, if you if you write political gags. I, re- re- I um, recommend this as a subgenre of humour. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. No, no, no. Bad party conference jokes. I promise you, you'll you 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 won't run out of supply quickly. Well, it's your it's your next book. Um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 um, I, your book, uh, everything in moderation. You believe that bringing more civility and nuance and compromise uh, into political life and life generally does humour aid this process. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you can be humorous and an extreme, you know. And one of the things is it's not it's not party specific being having a sense of humor. Um, so or 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 um, so no, I I would say not. I mean, it's part of. I do think, as I've said before, you know that that um, having a certain sense of your own ridiculousness is important, and I think that is part of being moderate person, um, because uh, you it's harder then to become. Uh, an extremist who has who's confident about their ability to remake the world. So definitely, the 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 sensibility of my humour and the sensibility of my politics have something in common. But everybody's different, and to put it mildly, my sense of humour is not the only sense of humour. Um, and some, you know, there's there's absolute comic genius that's attached to all, you know, to any amount of extremism of all. Uh, of all kinds so no um i wouldn't say i think that it's interesting because one of the things i've reflected on is a question of you know right-wing humor or left-wing humor i think um you know you've got to make you've got to be careful not to make fun of people out of their powerlessness effectively um and i do think punching punching yourself or punching up is funnier than punching down let's put it that way no, no, I completely agree. I think I think uh, it can seem very cruel and nasty when you punch down, and uh, I, I think that's what you have to avoid. And I think that's when uh, politicians get into trouble, and I think people in business get into trouble is when they, you know, they they hit the defenceless person. So I completely agree. If I asked you to write a business case for humour, Danny, what would you include? Okay, well, I think the the first thing that I would include in any uh, in any description, any discussion I have with a politician about a speech, right? Uh, the first thing I say is you've got to be authentic, uh, and you've got to try to um, to to say what you really think as the starting point, and then work from there. 
uh, begin to think what you can say to the audience, why you can't say certain things. And that is the starting place for um, for any uh case in business or any case that you might make to somebody else and and therefore your humor plays a role in that you you should you should not try to be something you're not um your jokes if you use jokes uh, they've got to be ones that you find funny um uh, with a degree of uh consideration as to whether other people will share that sensibility um but they're part of um authenticity i think um the, the second is that um i think in any um in any walk of life it makes sense to uh, for things to be um for you to, sh to show a sense of self-deprecation um that you understand your own vulnerabilities because people uh reciprocate concessions if they realize you're willing to say uh things about their their own your own weaknesses they'll be willing to accept theirs and criticisms you might have of theirs more readily and i think that's um important and then don't forget also entertainment right you are when you're making a case of any kind for a business to sell something or you're making a political point, um, telling a story, a compelling story is very important because people understand arguments through stories and it relates to them. And humour has a very important part in storytelling as well. And so um, unquestionably, if you're giving a, a hard message, you, you do want to try to keep the audience with you and to divert people uh, and taking, making some, taking some trouble to make your story uh you'll make your pieces amusing your speeches amusing is part of that and the audience finds it flattering um they realize you've taken trouble uh, they like you more all those things are very helpful um but you know you do have to understand your own limitations in, in joke telling uh it's very important that you test those to make sure that they are actually funny to other people not just yourself um and um that you don't uh you know say things that you then later regret just because you thought they were funny at the time i i, I think uh, they're brilliant points uh going back to the authenticity um how do people find that authenticity which is you know i, I suppose it's our jobs to help them find that but isn't that one of the hardest things is people um can't find uh, who they are, uh, or at least can't project who they are in normal life onto a business stage or a politics yeah. stage. I think they start off in the wrong place, right? They start with um, who other people are and wanting to sound like other people. And I think starting with yourself, I mean, it's, it's hard, but every, well, I, one of the things that my editor sometimes says to me is, oh, well, Danny, you like everybody, right? And that is a little bit true. I, I do, I tend to like people. Um, and so very, very few people are completely unwinning um, if they were truly themselves. And sometimes I see people get into trouble by being, trying to be something they aren't or more than they are, or kind of sometimes then end up being less than they are. I do think um, you know, not everybody's, equally funny you don't have to i wouldn't re don't reach for it too much because then it just it doesn't work um but most people are you know kind of uh wryly amusing and if they're willing to kind of be vulnerable enough to show their humor um which is part of being vulnerable enough to be to show their authenticity then um then they can be funny I, I love the fact that you say that, that your editor says to you, Danny, you like everybody, because I have a theory um, and from a psychological standpoint, because I walk into every room assuming that everyone is lovely, because what's the alternative? The alternative is what, what causes mayhem, is that you go, I've heard he's a bit of a bastard. And so therefore, I start to react as, and as soon as you pull a face, which may be an innocent face, I go, there, there's my proof. Whereas if you go in presuming everybody's got good intentions and is lovely, that that works. That's an interesting, an interesting experience on social media um, where I respond to people who are being horrible as if they hadn't been horrible and are actually lovely. And at least half the time, I wouldn't say it was more than that, but half the time, um, by the end of the conversation, they're being quite lovely. Um, and um, 
quite often we have a sort of expectation in other people that they won't be. Um, and actually that's one of the things that produces them not being. So it is a bit probably, a bit, I am a bit probably of a, 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 a fool myself a little bit about people's qualities and maybe it's a tiny bit naive, but I'd rather be that way. And I think actually uh, it's a very smart way to be because I think that the reciprocity comes across. You know, people, you're, you're nice to someone, they do tend to feel that they should be nice back. And, and the longer you keep that up there. So that's something for our audience to take away. Um, we come to the part of the show, Danny, called Quick Fire Questions. Quick Fire Questions! Who's the funniest business or political person that you've met? Uh, well, as a team, William Hague, and this will surprise a lot of people, George Osborne, who's the most brilliant mimic and very funny. Oh, really? Well, I didn't expect that answer. Yes. Oh, well, we, uh, if he's funny, we should have him on the... Uh, you should. Uh, I'll, 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 give you, I'll give him a call and tell him you recommended him. What book makes you laugh? I should say... Um, Actually, the answer to that is obvious. Catch-22. I thought Catch-22 was absolutely brilliant. You know Joseph Teller's comment when sure. someone said to him, uh, you've never written a book as uh, good as Catch-22, and he said, uh, yeah, you're quite right, but neither is anyone else. <laughs> that, that's brilliant. No. Oh, I've never heard that quote, but it's fantastic. What film makes you laugh, Danny? Oh, um, Annie Hall, um, and uh, I love When Harry Met Sally. Virtually, I can virtually... Uh, dictate that film to you in a kind of boring way that that guy does in Sliding Doors, you know, when he's repeating all the Monty Python. Yeah, Annie Hall, Annie Hall and, and, and um, When Harry Met Sally. Uh, Annie Hall is just full of brilliant one-liners. Like, I, uh, honey, there's a spider in the bathroom the size of a Buick. Yes, I just why don't you get, uh, you've got a copy of National Review, why don't you get William F. Butley to kill the spider? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and and the scene in the VW uh, when when he when he's she's driving really erratically, and he goes, "It's okay, we can walk to the curb from here." Yeah, absolutely. That's brilliant. And then there's, uh, yeah, and uh, we, we, uh, while your your uh, family was doing that, mine was being raped by Cossacks. I, I thought that it was very very good that film. That's right, yeah, that, that's the most fun I've ever had without laughing. There's also a line from that. <laughs> Wait, um, <laughs> uh, what is not funny, Danny? Yeah, I don't like toilet humour. Never, ever laugh at it. So and even as a... Was the, was the seven-year-old, uh, as the Jesuits no, no. would say, Danny was not laughing at uh, farts? N never. Not when I was seven, not now. Ah, that's, that's Very extraordinary. Weird. It is, yeah. I, in fact, it completely bewilders me. I can't, I don't find it funny and I can't, I don't understand why other people find it funny at all. But um, And I realise it's just a missing chip, but there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, what word makes you laugh, Danny? Oh, isn't that that thing with, uh, I should say that thing about Neil Simon, as in uh, that fantastic film, The Sunshine Boys, which could have been named, which is that anything with a K, words with a K in it are funny. <laughs> I think that's which is funny. why a spider the size of a Buick is funnier. Pickle yeah. is funny. Pickle tomato, is funny. But tomato isn't funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, Neil Simon, no, I completely, uh, I Neil remember Simon. the Neil Simon. Can I just recommend anyone who's interested in the craft of humour, the Neil Simon's memoirs, particularly the first volume, but they're amazing. They're oh, really, really well, good. there you go, a book recommendation as well. Um, you've got a master's degree. Uh, you're uh, a, a very, very uh, prominent journalist. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Oh, either would be really nice. <laughs> 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 I don't have to pick. Um, I, I uh, even quite funny or quite clever would be would be uh, nice. Um, but the worst thing is unfunny. I I, th I think stupid would be uh, the way of choosing. I can't choose clever or funny, but I can say that I would rather be called stupid than unfunny. Right? Because unfunny is like the most embarrassing thing. That means you tried to make a joke and people didn't laugh. Horrendous. So unfunny would. Uh, that's my way of answering your question. Okay, no, no, that's it. And finally, desert island gags. 
you can only take one joke with you to a desert island. Yeah. What is it? Okay, dear Roy Castle, I found a black disc with a hole in it at the bottom of my garden. Is this a record? <laughs> That's one for the older members of our audience. Danny, thank you so much for being a wonderful, amusing, brilliant guest on the Humorology podcast. Thank you. I really love doing it. It was great. But the, the pressure of uh, people listening to it, thinking, I hope this is going to be funny, was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Good job you were. <laughs> The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.